is Indian country today. Esquilly, yes, and thank you for joining us. I'm Patty Tholohungva. Here are the headlines for Tuesday, October 27th. The fallout from the Phoenix Indian Medical Center closing its birthing center continues. Officials say the closure is temporary, but are not saying when the OBGYN department will reopen. Our national correspondent, Dalton Walker, worked in partnership with ABC 15 in Phoenix. He spoke to a former CEO of the hospital to find out the process to close such a vital department. When I was in private practice, if I was ready to close my services, by law, under the Board of Medical Examiners, I needed to notify my patients of what was happening. I couldn't just let them loose. They needed at least a 30-day notice. Yet mothers say they were not given enough notice before their due dates. And many are still figuring out how to pay for the birth of their child. Now that PIMC is no longer delivering babies, officials said last week the hospital will continue to provide prenatal care and other pre-delivery care. However, one mom said that is not the case for her. Brianna Allman, who is Navajo, is 35 weeks pregnant. Last Friday, she went to her prenatal checkup at PIMC and was told that was her last visit. PMIC would no longer offer prenatal checkups. I think Indian Health Service had to at least provide some responsibility and accountability to help the moms connect to another source of care. Um, at least on a financial basis, because they know the impact it could have on the mother's economic status and the family. Molina says PIMC is known for its culturally-based OB care. Our Native women who come to PIMC for their care expect not only the quality care, but they anticipate that they're going to be respected and validate their tribal beliefs, their tribal values, and their ceremonies. Molina is a retired PIMC obstetrician and delivered hundreds of babies there in the 90s. Today, he is the Corporate Compliance Officer with Native Health. These women have such a unique, strong uh, concept of the delivery of their infant. It's something that's very sacred to them. It's something that's very beautiful. And they will perform ceremonies after the baby's delivered because this is the way of life. This is the way of life for our people. PIMC offered that, and I think that was the greatest value they had but so unfortunate that it was taken away from them. Now, it's not just the mothers who are asking questions. On Monday, we also learned a bipartisan group of Arizona lawmakers have sent a letter to Indian Health Service demanding answers about the closure. In Phoenix, Dalton Walker, Indian Country Today. We will continue to follow this developing story. In our coverage of Native Vote 20, Indian Country Today is following the races of 14 Native American candidates running for Congress from both parties. A few are incumbents running for re-election, but most are hoping to sit in Congress for the first time, like Aloha Aina Party member Jonathan Hoot Manawanui, who is Native Hawaiian. Hawaii is a blue state, voting for Clinton in 2016 and voting for Obama in 2012. If elected, Hoot Manawanui would be the second Native Hawaiian in Congress since statehood. He faces a three-way race for the congressional seat. He's going against Republican Joe Akana and Democrat Kai Kahele, who are also Native Hawaiians. Alaska Native corporations are taking their funding fight to the high court. The corporations are asking the U.S. Supreme Court to help them with eligibility for the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act. Law 360 reports that several Alaska Native corporations filed a petition challenging a federal appeals court ruling that barred them from receiving money from the CARES Act. They say the decision deprives Alaska Natives of assistance while conflicting with the Ninth Circuit and treatment of Alaska Native corporations. In September, a three-judge panel of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District uh, D.C. Court ruled that Alaska Native corporations were not tribal governments and therefore did not qualify for CARES Act funding. Principal Chief Richard Sneed of the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians is weighing in on recent support for the Lumbee Recognition Act. The Principal Chief is calling out what he says is political pandering by both the Trump and Biden presidential campaigns. In a statement, the chief says the Lumbee failed to meet the standards for federal recognition at every level. History and facts must guide the process, not politics. The purpose of federal recognition is to empower authentic Native peoples to protect and preserve their culture and identity, not to grant federal endorsement to large-scale cultural identity theft, he said. Sneed added that Congress should listen to tribes who understand these issues. 
And those are the headlines from Indian Country Today for Tuesday, October 27th. I'm Patty Thawahungva. When we come back, October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. What's new in addressing this issue in Indian Country? We'll talk with an expert when we come back. October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, and with people forced to spend more time at home this year, shelters and hotlines are reporting a higher volume of survivors looking for help. Recently, President Trump signed two bills into law to improve communication and data sharing between tribal, local, and federal stakeholders. But funding for life-saving tribal domestic violence shelters remains unauthorized. Joining us today with more on this is Elizabeth Carr. And she is the Senior Native American F Affairs Advisor for the National Indigenous Women's Resource Center. Welcome, Elizabeth. Thank you. Well, let's start with just getting an idea. You know, this pandemic has uh, created a new situation with more people staying at home. How is it affecting people in domestic violence uh, situations? Sure. Well, we know that the pandemic, unfortunately, has had a disproportionate impact on Indian country. And as it continues um, to kind of wreak havoc in our communities, we know that our advocates and our tribal victim program uh, service providers in our shelters are facing additional challenges, um, really just trying to work to avoid disrupting any services for Native victims. Um, we know that in some of our uh, programs that staff have been cut uh, to be uh, financial, they were financially impacted um, by the revenue decreases within um, each individual tribal nation. And it's really kind of created a bit of a patchwork of tribal advocates and victim service providers across the country. And of course, now they also face an escalated risk of transmitting uh, COVID um, to both themselves and their families by providing services to uh, folks who may need shelter. Um, so we know that a lot of our tribal programs have transitioned their advocacy efforts online, but unfortunately, as we know, um, broadband internet access is sometimes a challenge in our communities. And so uh, those folks who, who don't really have that great access to internet have been uh, forced to main, uh, maintain services and, and advocacy in person. Um, but there, you know, our services remain strong um, and resilient and, and we continue to provide those services to folks who need them. Um, in these uncertain times when people are being recommended to stay home, it's, we're really reminded that home isn't always the safest place and that there's a tragic reality that the pandemic has really put our relatives in abusive relationships at a heightened risk of violence because of the stay at home orders. Um, and what we recommend if you don't have access to shelter or services in your own community uh, to reach out to the Strong Hearts Native Helpline. Um, that, you know, we have adv advocates there who understand uh, the unique challenges that uh, Native survivors face um, and they're av available every day to talk from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. Central Time. And that um, outreach is for people living on the reservations, but also in urban areas, right? That's absolutely correct. We are um, available to anybody who needs assistance and, and people can reach us by calling 1-844-7-NATIVE or 1-844-762-8483. All right, and, and do you have any data or any kind of um, anecdotal information on the number of, of cases? Is it higher in urban areas or is it higher on the reservation? So I think that's unclear um, because of the way data is collected. Um, you know, we, it, we've been talking about this as an issue for a very long time um, in Indian country and in the field. Um, appropriate demographic data isn't always collected. Um, but I will say that in terms of COVID, you know, and, and what we've seen from Strong Hearts um, is that during the initial lockdown and, and shutdown uh, stay at home period, we did see a decrease in the number of callers to our hotline. Um, that doesn't indicate that abuse was not happening. It might indicate that uh, abuse uh, survivors don't have the ability to call because they're um, 
trapped, if you will, uh, with their abuser. But at the same time, we did see um, increased visits to our website. So we know that there is still a need. Um, and in the past couple of weeks, last month or so, um, we've seen an uptick in calls now that uh, stay at home orders are being lifted. So I think when we talk about, uh, you know, the data associated with COVID, um, I think time will tell. Um, but we know that during previous um, disasters, that abuse does seem to be escalated. So, um, you know, I strongly encourage any viewers, even if you're just a family member who needs um, resources to reach out to Strong Heart State of Helpline um, during this time of need. All right. Now let's move on to the two acts that were recently signed into law, um, starting with the Savannah's Act. What did they do to help the situation? So Savannah's Act is really uh, an attempt to uh, increase and improve improve uh, data collection and coordination with the federal government. Um, and we're really excited about that because as I indicated before, it's a really strong need um, in Indian country. Uh, you know, we, we don't truly understand the devastating impacts of the missing and murdered indigenous women's crisis because we don't have the numbers. We just, you know, we have uh, sporadic data from uh, different sources, but none of it's really tied together. And so our hope is with Savannah's Act, we'll be able to do a little bit better coordination and um, hopefully get more uh, law enforcement agencies, both tribal and non-tribal to uh, really uh, step up their game in terms of being able to record um, cases of missing and murdered indigenous women. And that, that's certainly the case, the need for more data, because as we watched states uh, one by one start to adopt, you know, a missing and murdered indigenous women's uh, initiative in some case, you know, they were talking about collecting data first. Um, not all of them had appropriations for those committees, though, to, to really get in there. So uh, this week, Arizona is going to be looking into where they are a year from out from establishing a missing and murdered indigenous women's um, initiative. And so we'll continue to follow that. But um, what, what kind of changes do you want to see made to Savannah's Act? You know, I think in terms of Savannah's Act, I, it, it's it's the law. So we are now focused on the implementation period of it. So we look forward to working with Department of Justice and Department of Interior to implement it in the best way possible. And that means in consultation with tribes um, and in consultation with tribal advocates who understand what's going on on the ground and where the gaps really are um, to really improve that coordination. So uh, we look forward to the implementation process and um, working to improve the process altogether. All right, and what about um, the Not Invisible Act? What does this bill do and how does it do it? Yes, the Not Invisible Act is a really, uh, really uh, basically what it does is it aims to uh, form an advisory committee of federal lawmakers, uh, federal agencies, tribal, uh, tribal representatives, advocates, survivors, and family members. Um, it's similar to the uh, the Operation Lady Justice Task Force that the president um, had uh, put forth with the executive order. However, this um, will improve it in that it includes tribal voices, um, unlike the Operation Lady Justice Task Force. So again, we look forward to ensuring that that task force is, or excuse me, the advisory committee that is formed with a not invisible um, act is uh, well resourced with with the right folks and, and making sure that uh, tribal voices are included in anything that is um, comes out of that task force. It seems like there's a, a lot of movement, which is good, uh, but all just within the last year, um, maybe maybe 18 months, uh, but more recently, uh, a lot of activity around around domestic violence and then also missing and murdered Indigenous women. Yeah, that's right. It's um, it's it's a lot of times I like to say, you know, we we talk about the movement and it, it's been going on for a long time, right? You know, all of the, our elders and ancestors have talked about this issue since before before our time, um, but we're finally seeing some baby steps being made. And you know, I think there's a lot more to be done and there's a lot more to accomplish, but I think we need to uh, recognize that the level of awareness is, is um, really unprecedented. And it really, talk, it really, you can attribute it to, I think, um, both Congresswoman uh, Sharice Davids and Congressman Deb Holland uh, being in office and elevating the, the issues of Native women um, to a point where we're visible. Um, so we're really excited about being able to, um, you know, uh, gain momentum and continue on and, and get some more uh, accomplished in the next couple of years. Absolutely. And Indian Country Today was um, at the signing in Minnesota, 
when uh, Lieutenant Governor Peggy Flanagan signed th that state's missing and murdered indigenous women uh, bill there. So, you know, absolutely looking at, the, you can't underestimate the, the um, impact that having native leadership uh, steer this conversation here. So your group also, uh, and along with some other nonprofit, native nonprofits, you're advocating for the reauthorization of the Family Violence Prevention and Services Act. What, what is that bill about? So that bill is really the one of the only uh, federal programs that provides uh, resources to shelters. And so we know that we have less than 60 shelters in Indian country and FIPSA is a critical resource for those shelters that exist. Um, they basically provide the, the funding to keep the doors open, to keep the lights on, and it's critically necessary for our tribal communities to have those resources. And so while it's unauthorized, it's still, um, still functional in terms of, you know, the money is still being appropriated, but we really want to be able to see it um, be, be reauthorized so that it's safe uh, for the appropriation process and so we'll continue to push for that we're pushing for um, some enhancements as well on the tribal side to include the permanent authorization of both the Alaska Native Women's Resource Center as well as the Strong Hearts Native Helpline and then incre increase um, the amount that tribes are getting as well um, because we know that 60 shelters is not nearly enough for the amount of um, disproportionate impact domestic violence has on our communities and so we continue to advocate on behalf of our, our sisters out in Indian country and we'll continue to do that um, in this next Congress as well. So not just the mothers, but also the children who are so often, you know, also involved in these domestic violence situations. Um, and if anyone's out there is watching and wants to know a little bit more about, like, you know, sometimes when you're in the middle of something, you don't, don't understand that. So what are some of the signs that people should look out for that, you know, say, hey, this is not a, not a normal situation. This is, this is something that you should be seeking help for. What are some of those signs? So I think some of the questions you want to ask yourself is, does your partner threaten to hurt you or your children? Ask what you are, or what you're up to, follow you, act jealous, um, constantly call or text you to check up on you. Uh, make jokes about you, about your culture, about being Native, um, demand you spend more time with them and less time with your family and friends, um, and pressure you to do things that you may not want to do. And I think these are all some of the, the common tactics of domestic violence, but really it's about power and control. And if someone, your partner in particular, is you know attempting to control you through um, these types of tactics, and that's domestic violence. So the number to Strong Hearts Native Helpline is 1-844-7-NATIVE or 1-844-762-8483. We also offer chat advocacy as well on our website at strongheartsnativehelpline.org. Um, and there's a chat now button. If you don't feel comfortable making that phone call, our advocates are happy to chat with you online as well. And people can access that even on their phone, right? That's correct. All right. Any last thoughts before we go, Elizabeth? No, thank you very much for covering uh, domestic violence. It is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, and we ask that tribal leaders, advocates, and family members continue throughout the rest of the year to keep an eye out for uh, domestic violence, You know, stand up for your relatives, and, and make sure that this issue isn't forgotten because it's still, unfortunately, um, pretty prevalent in our communities, and our, 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 our folks deserve better. So again, thank you so much for having us. All right, Elizabeth Carr, the Senior Native Affairs Advisor for the National Indigenous Women's Resource Center. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you. And we'll be right back. Where is Indian country represented the best in state government? Colby Kicking Woman is our correspondent based in Washington, D.C., and his recent story is all about that. Welcome, Colby. Hi, Patty. Thanks for having me today. Sure. And so where can Indian country see a good reflection of its population in state office? Uh, so my story focused on Montana, uh, where they have 11 members in their uh, state legislature, which reflects uh, the population demographics. 
uh, nat the native population in Montana is roughly 7% and the 11 members uh, in the state house uh, make up the same number. Uh, so that's uh, a very good reflection of, of the, the state makeup. And so really truly seen in state government, uh, the reflection in population because Montana has how many tribes there? Uh, eight federally recognized tribes. And so people from these tribes and, and perhaps other tribes have run for state office there and have been in office and that's been for a while now. It's, it's, uh, they've always had a, well, for a long, oh, I don't know, how many years would you say they've had that kind of representation in the state office? So it, it fluctuates every uh, election cycle a little bit. The 11 members are the, the highest that they've ever had. Um, but, you know, in recent years, it's just been, been as many as nine, uh, 10. Um, it, it, so it, it's a range, but it seems to be increasing uh, each election cycle. And so when you look at this at, on a national level, across the country, the Native American population is what, about 2% of the US population? And uh, when you look at Congress, what does what does that equal out to when it comes to representation? Uh, so in Congress, it would be uh, 11 members. I think the exact number is 10.7, but um, it's safe to say I think we deserve a round up there. Uh, and so yeah, currently there's the, the four members uh, in Congress, and uh, we're you know covering a number of people looking to join uh, Sharice Davids, Mark Wayne Mullen, Tom Cole, and, and Deb Holland. So maybe we'll see a, a higher number at the federal level as well. That's right. So again, looking at the U.S. Congress and the reflection there when it comes to uh, Native Americans, so four in Congress, and uh, to make that equitable uh, population-wise, we would need 11 people in Congress, Native Americans representing uh, their districts in, in the U.S. Congress. So um, the governor of Montana had some interesting things to say about working with um, the Native American leaders. Yeah, he you know spoke highly of the it's the Montana American Indian Caucus. Uh, all eleven members are part of it, and there's an additional non-native person. Uh, they have a, a, a good relationship with the governor and uh, his Indian Affairs office. Just recently, they opened uh, what they call Tribal Flag Plaza outside in front of the Capitol, where the flags of all uh, eight federally recognized tribes fly next to the, the state flag and the uh, American flag. Uh, Barbara Vassett, uh, the woman who I interviewed for my story. Uh, you know, said that experience was, you know, a very spiritual experience watching those flags go up and, and knowing uh, just, you know, what Native people have had to endure in order to get that representation and to see those flags fly at, at the Capitol for generations to come is, is, was an awesome, awesome sight. That's got to be uh, quite a sight, yes, because um, you know, that is not happening in so many other states that have large Native American populations. Um, what else has uh, this uh, high number of Native representation in the state uh, government, what has it done to uh, impact tribes there? Uh, what other issues have they been able to tackle? Well, I think having such uh, equal representation, you know, these people know what affects their communities the most. and. They not only represent, you know, uh, some of the members in the state house represent uh, the, from the reservations and from the tribes, but there's also, you know, people representing the urban native population. And so they've been able to bring up legislation uh, concerning missing and murdered indigenous women, uh, Medicaid expansion, uh, language preservation. And so, you know, like I said, they, they know uh, what their constituents are saying, the issues that their tribes are facing uh, at, at a local level. And so they're able to bring that to the, to the state legislature. It's so uh, interesting to see that. And so again, we're looking at the races for um, uh, in this uh, election time period and uh, following what's happening there in Montana. So um, come next week, uh, what are you going to be doing on election day and night? Oh, well, it's gonna be a busy one for us. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, you know, being from Montana, I'm a little bit biased. I'm interested uh, in some of the races there. Um, not only for their state legislature and, and natives that are running there, but also uh, at the Senate race. Uh, Steve Bullock has a chance to, to flip Montana uh, next door in Idaho. Paula Jordan is running for, uh, for Senate and, and looking to flip Idaho, which is a traditionally red state. Uh, Rudy Soto uh, is also in a, in a campaigning for the Congre uh, House congressional seat there. Um, so yeah, and you know, on numerous other races across the country. So it's gonna be an exciting night for sure. Absolutely. Just following all of these different races, you know, our team from Indian Country today, uh, we are following on election night more than 100 Native American candidates running for both national office and also state office. And um, so, uh, and it's been, what, two years now on the campaign trail practically. 
and following all of these candidates. Uh, and you've had some interesting uh, uh, coverage there throughout this campaign. Yeah, you know, the, the stories are, are almost countless, it seems. There's a, a lot of uh, interesting people running for, you know, you know all, all levels of government, not only for the U.S. Congress, but also state houses, state auditor positions, um, you know, Supreme Court spots. And so it's just, it's just awesome to see uh, all, these, all these natives running for across the country. Well, I thought you were going to bring up your interview with uh, uh, Senator Bernie Sanders uh, when you got him to laugh pretty hard there. <laughs> That, that was a highlight. You know, the the two native forums, you know, were were historical. And you know, to to say that I got a chance to interview Senator Sanders is, is something I'll always remember. Yes, and and so just you know, again, seeing how the race narrowed down from you know a year and a half ago, looking at all the candidates running for president on the Democratic uh, ticket, and then now we're down to the final two with uh, Donald Trump and Joe Biden. So we'll continue to follow this. And Colby Kicking Woman, thank you for your story and thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Patty. Appreciate it. And thank you for watching. Uma Umuk, that's the Uk Galyani. Take care of yourselves. Your life is precious. I'm Patty Thawahungva. Join us again tomorrow. Indian Country Today is recorded at the Phoenix Indian School Visitor Center in Phoenix, Arizona. This is Indian Country Today.